All right, everyone, it's time for the occult video 139 about how Tolkien was fundamentally right and Norse paganism, which is what Lord of the Rings sort of stuff was largely based on, at least in a loose sense, uh, explains the past rather than predicting the future. We saw, I believe it was 2011, people were talking about Ragnarok and how it was supposedly going to occur in February of that year. Was it a 2013? It was one of those years around that you know, easily forgotten time period of the uh, boring Obama era. Anyway, if you read the Poetic Eddas, which are based on older texts, but are presumably somewhat accurate, you'll notice something strange. You'll notice that uh, figures like Gandalf are actually literally mentioned uh, within the Poetic Eddas, uh, within the Voluspa, uh, the prophecy of the voices. What I see Ragnarok ultimately as is a past. I don't see it as a future event or as a predictive of the future. I think what we're looking here uh, at is much like other tales from mythology or from spiritual systems. I think what we're seeing are historical records. Now, when you're talking about history before sort of the scientific method period, what you're getting are essentially true events that have uh, a core of actual content that's literally true. And then built upon that, you have layers of hyperbole. And I'm going to speak about that in the next video as well, but it goes into Troy and the Odyssey and all of these other things. Sometimes people have this tendency to either take spiritual works, you know, even if they were meant to be taken as historical, like Sumerian writings or something. They either look at it as pure liter uh, literalism. That is, they look at the Bible. They see the tales there in the OT. And they say, oh, well, these happened. There was actually a worldwide flood. Uh, you know, it, the, the world was created in six days and so forth. Or they take it as all metaphor. Why don't more people look at it as fundamental core of truth built around uh, hyperbole? That is, this seems to be what was the case with, you know, any of the great epics. So why don't we apply that to other religions? They talk about uh, the difference between, like, Christianity as a living religion so-called, or Islam, or something that's still practiced widely today, they sort of differentiate their own spiritual texts from all of these others that nonetheless were treated much the same in their time. Uh, and in the future, a thousand years from now, probably others will be treated in the same way. When I look at Tolkien, therefore, I say he was fundamentally right. His tales being based on Eddas that in turn were based on what are supposedly a collection of now no longer fully extant historical texts, what I see is that some of these things, of course he elaborated, there's a lot of, again, hyperbole there, but the core is actually true. There was a Ragnarok, it was called the Ice Age, or maybe it was a miniaturized sort of cold spell in an otherwise warmer period that people witnessed. Uh, the gnomes and dwarves and elves and so forth that it speaks of then simply become different human lineages which share culturally and ethnically different traits um, from the culture speaking of these events that are now either extinct or interbred out of existence into a, a sort of new human race, a new Caucasoid race. Of course, we're talking about the Norse uh, sort of materials here. We're not talking about some scripture uh, from the aboriginal culture or something. It'd be uh, largely separate. This would be Northern Europe, uh, essentially. Uh, even if you look at the wanderings of this Gandalf the Cain elf or whatever, and all of his sort of elvish compatriots or dwarven compatriots, it's not entirely clear what the delineation is in all cases between these different categories. If you actually read the passages literally, what you get is the sense that due to an encroaching cold in, I assume, Scandinavia, they travel first through sort of this marshy area and then into uh, what, what is listed as desert, but is probably, you know, sort of grassland. It seems to me that this is literally talking about some semi-nomadic human group that gets pushed out of uh, Scandinavia within this specific part of the passages with the Gandalf stuff through Denmark or something comparable to that, or maybe like uh, the Baltics with some of the marshes there goes further south and ends up in what they would have considered extremely warm, uh, maybe southern European grasslands and steppe climates, maybe Spain, maybe southern France or something. And so it's, it makes sense. It is literal. It's literally true. The names may be different from the actual names. They may have been changed over time. The specific story may have been built into 
uh, a hyperbolic structure over time such that things get more and more and more grand. They get put down on writing, reinterpreted, they get even grander. And so the ultimate story, as we see culminating in the uh, sort of uh, late pre-modern period with Tolkien's lore, we're actually witnessing, when we watch The Lord of the Rings, or especially read the materials, of course the movies aren't quite the same as the books, especially with The Hobbit, which I liked the movies, and I'm in the minority on that, but I thought they were quite well done. Third one dragged on too long, but we'll let that aside. When we look at this, interestingly enough, <clears throat> we are seeing a modern and hyperbole addled retelling of, in turn, a, a late pre-modern uh, hyperbole addled retelling of the poetic eddas, which in turn are a reinterpretation, a recopying of older, ex, uh, no longer extant historical texts. That's what we're getting. So Tolkien fundamentally is a little bit like Homer. Uh, some people may say, oh, that's kind of a stretch. Yes, but the whole story is a stretch. Even the poetic eddas are probably extremely hyperbolic when compared to the original core texts or oral tradition from which those stories came. Read the Voluspa. Read, you can read all of these eddas. A lot of people haven't read them. You'll see all sorts of weird stuff in there. We're talking about s things that seem a little bit like a, a soap opera for deities. It's a little bit like the Silmarillion or something like that. It's all a takeoff of a takeoff of a takeoff. And so fundamentally, insofar as he's retelling basically the same general story, only elaborating so greatly on it that it no longer uh, fundamentally resembles the original, he's not doing anything uh, that isn't like uh, Plato's Atlantis or you know turning into Donnelly's Atlantis and then turning into the New Age Atlantis. It's the same thing. I spoke of that before. Each time it gets retold and there's sort of a shift in how people understand one of these things, the meaning is totally shifted, but the core of truth is still there. If you read the original text, yes, there was an Atlantis. It was physically there. It, it did exist at some point. What form did it take? We have no clue. It could have been Santorini, in which case we're talking about a town that simply had multi-level structures and happened to be marginally more advanced than its neighbors at the time. Or we're talking about Crete, so we're talking about Knossos, something like that. Yes, it would have been grand, it would have been splendid. Maybe they even developed ironworking at the time, and we just don't have evidence of that quite yet. Regardless, though, it existed in some form. It was spoken of in a literal sense. Talk about the pillars of Hercules, as though the, the, the term meant the same thing thousands of years ago, as opposed to within the Roman period, talking about like the Rock of Gibraltar or whatever. Uh, it has nothing. It has no overlap whatsoever. It's a different story, but the core of truth is still ultimately there. I say that Tolkien, in that sense, is an occultist in a way. I think he probably did have some understanding of magic. Uh, I, I have to assume that when you when you look at all of the words used and the constant prevalence of magic within his works. Yeah, his obsessive level of detail, uh, uh, I think, belies where his interests truly were. And he was raised at a time, uh, ultimately, where magic was having an early renaissance. Then it collapses like a couple decades later, and it doesn't really reemerge till the end of the 80s and into the internet era. And now we're in the next occult renaissance. You know, I'm making a video about the occult right now. What more need you know, I suppose? Hmm. Yeah, Tolkien, some good stuff. I watch Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and all this stuff religiously. Even like the uh, one aside that has nothing to do with magic or, or the Eddas or anything like that. Gandalf actually existed, my friends. Uh, those uh, shorter films, and in some cases I think a couple feature length films, that uh, I can't remember the group that made them, but they did like Finding Gollum and some of these others. Those are actually really well made. In fact, they're, uh, they're just as good as, uh, <laughs> other than the uh, special effects, of course. They're just as good as, like, Lord of the Rings are uh, probably better than at least the third part of The Hobbit. Uh, great respect to them for telling some of these other side stories, uh, really, that are needed to flesh out sort of the Tolkien universe, uh, focus on some of these uh, people that aren't really talked about in uh, Peter Jackson's movies or even in earlier treatments. Honestly, I wish Bakshi would do his second part of Lord of the Rings. I think that'd be hilarious. I mean, can you imagine? He'd sit there and he'd be chuckling and like half naked. And he'd be going through and saying, Oh, I want it animated the same way as the first one. Because it'll become, you know, the <laughs> second part of this cult classic. So everything's like jerking around and randomly like shaking and shuddering. Getting all sorts of screwed up. 
with the really weird like 70s synth music and stuff be great be hilarious should uh you know make another version of the 70s hobbit too yeah or uh what was it rankin and bass's return of the king which actually was i mean it was watchable it was fun to watch all of them were including back work that's about all peace out